wrapping paper. Don't do it. Shower of notes, because today I actually have to have actual notes. Actual notes? Actual notes. Mm. Oh, that sounds like work. <laughs> it was, because this episode actually did require work. What are those? This episode did not come from our vast existing bank of knowledge. And bullshittery. Yes. <laughs> our <laughs> bank of knowledge and bullshittery that we usually provide to you, dear listeners. <laughs> I mean, you'll still get some of it. There's a little bit of it left. Just not as a little bit left. <laughs> are you saying we're running out? We are. We have a quota. It's almost full. Oh. So we're going to run out of bullshittery soon. We'll have to, like, back up the truck a bit. I don't know. Do some TBS reports. Yes. So we had to do extensive notes today because we are bringing you something brand new. Because we are bringing you an episode on con crimes. Dun dun. I just want to be, like, belts from the crudes and be like, dun dun dun. Pretty much. <laughs> I guess we should probably introduce ourselves before we do this episode, I guess. I mean, it's two seasons if you haven't figured out what podcast you're listening to at this point. <laughs> Please don't leave. Don't leave. Don't leave. We'll introduce ourselves. I'm Ash. I'm pretty sure I'm L. You're not quite sure today? I don't know Maybe. today. Mm. This we should, are lobby cosplay. Yeah, we should be lobby cosplay, and I'm pretty sure this is shit cosplayers say. Even though Do you today need to check the title? we are pretending we are a true crime podcast. Are we? Yes. Are we really? <laughs> today only. <laughs> For one day only. <laughs> we are going to pretend to be a true crime podcast. Oh, one day only engagement. <laughs> dun dun. I just keep thinking of Law and Order every time we talked about designing <laughs> this <know>. episode. <laughs> so we are both a fan of true crime podcasts, and we were trying to think up some episode ideas that weren't necessarily related to going and being at conventions, because obviously, as of right now, that's not really a thing. And we were like, what would be fun for our listeners while we kind of wait out this pandemic? Since we are fans of true crime, we thought it might be fun to try our hands at it. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> yep. If you like this episode, you should definitely let us know so we can do more in the future. Yes, because we took notes on more true crime so that we could do this again. There is a surprising amount of true crime in relationship to conventions. Is it really surprising? Well, no, I guess it really shouldn't be surprising, but like, not only are they surprising, they're typically really weird. Yes. <laughs> Which I guess also shouldn't be surprising. <laughs> no. Since we're talking about fandom conventions. Huh. So strange. So we did scour the internet for some of our favorites, and so we have two of them for you today, and so Ash is going to do hers first, and I don't know what Ash's is, so I'm very curious to find out. Mwahahaha. <laughs> <laughs> because she changed her mind last minute, so I don't know what hers is. Well, because sometimes you research, and then you don't find all the info you want, and you have to switch, it, switch your case. It happens. I did. Well, because I had a couple faves, um, and I thought that given the time frame, there was one that I was probably going to have to make a bunch of phone calls on in order to get all the information that I wanted to provide. And then the other one, I didn't have enough time to do as much background research on the particular victim or victims in question, where I felt like I would be doing them justice by telling their story. So I figured... This one's good. All right. Well, let's let's get it rolling. Let's crack into let's it. Let's crack into it. Yes. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I don't have any wine to pop, though. <laughs> Setting the stage for you. Uh, Phoenix Comic Con debuted in June of 2002 and has been an annual event in the Phoenix Mesa Scottsdale, Arizona area. Um, since then, it's been rebranded a couple of times. Um, later into Phoenix Comic Fest and Phoenix Fan Fusion, which I believe is the name that it is currently run under. 
Phoenix Comic Con in 2017 took place May 25th through May 28th at the Phoenix Convention Center and Hyatt Regency Hotel because, of course, it's a con, so there has to be a Hyatt involved. <laughs> Always at the Hyatt. <laughs> oh, there's so many Hyatts. There were more than 80,000 attendees that showed up that weekend, and they had more than 160 special guests, including actors, authors, comic artists, other geek icons, including actor and mixed martial artist Jason David Frank. <gasps> Swoon. I know, right? I love Who him. Who is most noted as playing Tommy Oliver in the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. And I love him. I do love him. I know, right? Swoon. <laughs> Swoon. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So for those of you who are sad and not in the know, <laughs> Tommy Oliver is the OG Green Ranger who bad boy turned good into the White Ranger who later becomes the leader of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Green Ranger was the hottest ranger, so... Heartthrob for all of us back in the day. Yep. <laughs> so, because if you were not in love with red, you were probably in love with green. That's accurate. Let's be honest. <laughs> so, we're just going to sideline that for now, because while this story does involve Jason David Frank, it is not about Jason David Frank, unfortunately. Or fortunately, depending on how you look I at it. I feel like if because... this is a true crime story, it's probably fortunate that he's... It's not about him. <laughs> right. It's going to be really my guess. About you. So it's Thursday and we have a con. And just like other con goers, 29 year old Matthew Sterling chatted with his friends online before adorning his cosplay and traveling to the Phoenix Convention Center. He was dressed in black tactical pants, a red bandana, black face paint for his rendition of Marvel's The Punisher. Now, Al, you used to work in a comic shop. Do you want to tell our listeners a little bit about The Punisher? I can try. The Punisher is not one I'm super familiar with, but basically punish those that basically deserve to be punished. He's, like, not with the law and kind of against, like, organized law enforcement and and pretty much everything that he used to be a part of, he is now against and is trying to punish those that will not get punished by the normal laws, basically. From what I remember about Punisher. So he is a vigilante. Unlike Batman, he's totally willing to, you know, kill a beast. Oh, well, yeah, he he'll, kill, he'll, he'll kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and essentially, like, my understanding of, because I have not read anything Punisher or seen anything Punisher related in a very long time, from what I recall, is he wages like his own little one man showdown versus especially organized crime because his wife and kids were killed by the mob. You know, as you do, you take out revenge and then you're like, well, that was pretty good. Let's keep going. <laughs> Mr. Sterling put on his cosplay and he was walking around the event. He took photos of some other attendees in the area, which happened to include some police officers who were patrolling the event. Posted him on social media. Unfortunately, Sterling's cosplay repertoire also included actual body armor, pepper spray, throwing stars, a shotgun bandolier with ammunition, a combat knife, two loaded 45 caliber handguns, a loaded 454 caliber handgun, and a loaded 12 gauge shotgun. How did he get into the con? He walked in. This was prior to all the security we see at cons now, right? This was like three years, almost four years ago. Oh, so no, not really. Well, but I do vaguely remember around this time when a lot of security got kind of amped up and they actually cut down on a lot of the realistic looking props. And I'm going to say this had a lot to do with it. <laughs> he walked in, there's videos, the news outlet's put them on the internet, you can watch him walk into the convention center, kind of walk around a little bit, talk to a couple staffers who point him at, like, the prop checking table, and then just walk away. And, you know, just, there he is, walking around with all of his stuff. So he's got this big bag strapped to his back, which I'm assuming has a shotgun in it that looks like the appropriate size for a 12-gauge. 
Ultimately, the police were tipped off when singer-composer Reiko Takahashi um, from California tipped off her local PD after he told her his plans over Facebook Messenger, because apparently that's what you do. They had initially met at one of her concerts a couple of years prior, and, you know, like some people do with their fans, they chit-chatted back and forth on the internet, text message, social media, but ultimately she ended up cutting off contact when he started sending messages that were somewhat threatening and delusional. Fair. So she, yeah, (laughs) I know, right? Weird. So she ended up sharing around 40 screenshots with authorities of various messages that were sent on that particular day, stating he had weapons and was planning to shoot officers. Sterling was wrestled to the ground and an arrest was made within 11 minutes of the Phoenix Police Department being contacted by her local authorities in Hawthorne, California. So they actually responded quickly and in a timely manner? Yes. To legit threats made over social media? Yes. I don't know if I've ever heard of that happening before. 11 minutes. Like, I'm being slightly facetious, but not at the same time. I know, right? Yeah, 11 11 minutes from when they got the phone call from the sergeant in California until they had located him at the event and had him in custody. Because that's a pretty big convention, correct? Well, yeah, they had 80,000 attendees that year, so it's a very large convention. So for them to be able to, like, get that notice and find him within 11 minutes is pretty impressive. They did have a large presence on grounds already. True. Because it was a large event in a big city. You're going to have cops patrolling the area anyway. It's no different than, like, when we go to Chicago area and there's cops walking around all over the place just in case. And apparently they thought that it was creditable enough, and so they took it seriously and located him quickly and were able to apprehend him. Um, No attendees were harmed, which is great. And it was discovered after his arrest that he had set a notification on his phone for that day to, quote-unquote, kill JDF. Ah. Which would have been a travesty. That would have been a travesty. Of epic proportions. So he had set a reminder for himself on his phone to kill Jason David Frank and had told this woman over Facebook Messenger that he was going to kill cops and had been walking around the event taking pictures of them and posting them on social media. After he just walked into the convention center with four loaded guns and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, he had his own little one-man arsenal. When they arrested him, they obviously took him in and interviewed him. He told Phoenix PD detectives that he considered himself to be a real-life version of the Punisher. His lawyer later argued that his delusions went back and forth between the Punisher and the Batman, which is a little conflicting considering the fact that Bruce doesn't murder. No, their their philosophies are kind of night and day. Also, isn't one Marvel and one DC? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Also that. (laughs) That also makes a difference. (laughs) I know this is going to come as a huge shock to you, um, especially as we've talked about since we are responsible for lots of convention rules with our groups from conventions past. Yes. Cosplay and prop rules were revised super last minute to outlaw all props, including those made from foam and cardboard. Initially, the ban was just for weapon replicas. Uh, vendors were still allowed to sell them, but buyers were required to keep them packaged until they left the convention center. Um, also, not surprisingly, they brought in more police and had an additional police presence throughout the weekend and added security screenings, which is probably what most of us are used to these days, going through wide-scale security screenings in larger events. And as they do, a lot of the cosplayers and the geeks and the weebs Um, bitched about it because how dare you keep me from having my props that I worked so hard on. I want to be able to have my fake gun or my super kick-ass sword that I bought in the dealer's room and I'm going to go like have sword fights in my backyard and then hope I don't hurt myself. (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I mean, as a cosplayer, I kind of get it, considering, if I'm remembering correctly, in the aftermath of some of this, some conventions really took this to the extreme and confiscated all these props and threw them out. I want to say that was a convention in New York where that happened, where they confiscated all props and then the props never got returned to their owners. They got disposed of. And that was a huge... uh cluster basically as a craftsman that would super piss me off yeah i get it so ultimately sterling was charged with attempted first degree murder four counts of attempted aggravated assaults aggravated assaults of an officer resisting arrest misconduct with body armor and carrying a weapon into a prohibited place he had a one-day bench trial that occurred on december 12th of 2019 which essentially for those of you don't know a whole lot about our law enforcement system means that he waived his right to a jury and chose to have it heard just by a judge. So on January 24th, 2020, Judge Jennifer Ryan Toil sentenced Sterling to 25 years in the Arizona State Hospital after being found guilty except insane. He will continue to undergo periodic evaluations by the Arizona Psychiatric Security Review Board, and if he is later determined to be mentally competent, he will serve the remainder of his sentence in state prison. And being the saint that he is, less than two months later, JDF released a statement saying, I've already forgiven him. Do I want him to serve jail time and get the mental help he needs? Absolutely. Bless you, Green Ranger. This dude had a reminder on his phone to murder you, and you're like, I forgive you. That's because he's the Green Ranger. You need to get the help that you need. I'm actually kind of impressed that they committed him to a facility rather than just throwing him in prison. Well, maybe that's just an Arizona thing. Maybe. Where they're they're good at that, as opposed to other places where they, other states where they completely got rid of all the statements. (coughs) Illinois. (coughs) Oh, do you have something stuck right there? Yeah. (coughs) Weird. You know, the states where the, the county prison is the largest mental health facility in the state? Yeah. <clears throat> you know. Huh, weird. Yeah, that doesn't upset the mental health professional in me at all. No. So I'm guessing he's still at that facility because we probably did not find him to be competent given his behaviors. Happy ending. Nobody died and he and he's getting the help he needs. And this is why you now wait in a really long line at C2E2 to go through the metal detector. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Because somebody who thought that they really did need to go murder somebody decided to take a small armory with them (laughs) into a con. (laughs) This is why we can't have nice things. Because our format in our country is reactive. So, of course, we weren't doing anything until somebody did something that made us react. That's how it works. After this, we saw a lot of cons that banned metal weapons. Because, of course, he had, like, a legit combat knife and throwing stars apparently throwing um, the stars chemicals, like throwing stars. really <laughs> like a ninja yes like a ninja oh come on let's be honest like if you had like a super weeb friend that was totally into like the fake swords and shit you would know that they would have throwing that's stars. true they would have throwing stars i just i can't see the punisher using throwing stars <laughs> like maybe it's the anime version of the punisher and we're like Shoo-shoo. but then i feel like he should have had a katana and not a shotgun Maybe we're maybe we're genre merging. I I don't know. Or maybe the throwing stars are for the Batman. Maybe because he has his little like bat batarangs. They didn't specify if they were bat shaped. I or not. I got you. Maybe they were bat shaped. I don't know. Banned a lot of metal weaponry, and um, I even saw metal armor banned after this. At one point, this is also probably where a lot of the rules that we've seen in regards to no lifelike looking weapons. Like, if you have a weapon or a prop that is clearly, clearly, like, character, then it's cool. But if it actually looks like a real handgun or a real shotgun or anything like that, they're like, mm, no. But that's also why prop check is important. Because your prop people can actually, like, look at all this stuff and know what they're looking for, hopefully. I don't know if they actually take the steps usually to have like people who actually know about props sit at the prop checking table at most conventions. I think it's usually just some random staff members. I feel like most of the 
the bigger cons, though, would at least have somebody on their, like, de-escalation response team or their security team that if the volunteer had a question about a prop, that they could call them over to look at it. At a lot of the bigger conventions that we frequent, some of the security personnel are actual, like, security or law enforcement elsewhere, even if they're just, like, volunteer weekend cops. Right, and they would be able to spot a real versus a fake. That makes sense. Well, that was a ride. I know, right? We're very, very happy that Jason David Frank did not die Absolutely. <laughs> My case is actually an unsolved mystery. Dun, dun. Dun. Dun, dun, dun. I am going to be doing the mysterious case of Midwest Fur Fest 2014 at the Hyatt! Hyatt! <laughs> Because <laughs> it's always a Hyatt, especially in Rosemont. Always in Rosemont is it the Hyatt. And part of the reason I picked this was because this we've literally frequent this hotel multiple times in the past like 20 years. Yep, sometimes multiple times in one year. We've been to so many conventions at this hotel, so I actually vividly remember this happening. So I thought it would be interesting to look into a little bit more about it because there was a lot of conflicting and overlapping information. So what is Midwest Fur Fest? It's an annual furry convention that takes place in Rosemont, Illinois at the Hyatt, which is a suburbs just outside of Chicago, which for our international listeners is one of our major cities in our country and also one of our major airports. So it's a very popular city to do large conventions. And Rosemont is legit right around the corner from the international airport that is there. Which is why the Hyatt is a common occurrence for a convention. It's also connected to the Donald Steffens Convention Center, which is one of the biggest convention centers in the area outside of McCormick Place, yeah, which is where C2E2 is found this kind of interesting that Midwest Fur Fest actually developed out of a sci-fi convention. And it turned into its own convention because the like mini convention that developed within the sci-fi convention got so big that it needed its own event. I'm pretty sure that's how Anime St. Louis happened too. I think, well, and that's how Anime um, NYC happened too. Is it like started within New York Comic Con and then like became its own thing and then went back into New York Comic Con and now I think it's back out to its own thing again because it got too big to be like engulfed by the larger event. Midwest Fur Fest has actually been around since 1999, which I had no clue that it's that old. Like us. Yes, it is old like (laughs) us. And typically they have about 10,000 attendees. Midwest Fur Fest actually raises money for charity so most of what they bring in actually goes to charity for animals and wildlife (laughs) this convention raises like five hundred thousand dollars a year for charity i know and they also have this really impressive art auction that tends to raise over ten thousand dollars a year this convention is known for being very charitable and being very inclusive and welcoming Good feel, good time from those that I know that have gone have always enjoyed it. But you might be asking, what is a furry? So if you have not met a furry, we are going to tell you what they are. Furry fandom is kind of this subculture that's interested in anthropomorphic animal characters that have human personalities and characteristics. A lot of times there's a role-playing element where the suitor will develop this fursona and they will play that character while they are in their suit. So while they're in their suit, they are that character. And not all characters talk. Some make sounds, some don't make any sounds. So sometimes they show their emotions and communicate using like full body movements with their suits. Oh, like emoting. Yes, they emote with their suits. Um, And the suits come in different levels from partials to full suits and in a variety of animals and combinations of animals. Both real and fantasy. So there's this big spectrum of what a fursona could be. And colors, too. So it's not always realistic, either. Like, there's, like, rainbow fox dragons out there and all sorts of stuff. Now, unfortunately, the furries have this unfortunate, like, attached with the concept that this is all about, like, sexual gratification and nothing else. Kind of like cosplay does by a lot of people who don't understand what cosplay is. 
And they think that, like, the only reason you're just dressing up in costume has something to do with, like, a sexual fetish. Which is not true for most furries. Most instances, they are looking for this warm, inviting community of creative people and a place to belong. So it's really similar to cosplay. And you will see a lot of furries at conventions because there are so many similarities between cosplayers and furries and the communities function in a similar way. Um, I would say that the furry community is probably a little kinder than the cosplay community, at least in my experience. But you're looking for the same thing. You're looking for a creative space to belong as you and not as what society or anyone else expects you to be, but as yourself. So in 2014, there was an event, as there is every year, for Midwest Fur Fest, held at the Rosemont Hyatt. And it was, they were having a good time, as they usually do. But on December 7th, which was Sunday, so this is like early, early morning Sunday. We're talking like around like midnight or so on Sunday. The fire alarm goes off. Now, we've all been to cons where the fire alarm gets pulled. Especially at the Especially Hyatt. Especially at the Hyatt. Like, this is a common occurrence. Most people just assume someone was being an ass and pulling the fire alarm for no reason. Because that's Because that's normal. Like, we typically hear that. Like, that's just how it is. Now, people started paying attention when they started seeing all these bright lights and law enforcement lights and technicians running around in like crazy like chemical protective spacesuit looking like has, things has hazmats has yes and then even the fbi showed up from the counterterrorism and weapons of mass destruction unit to wow. the hyatt why you say did they show up at the hyatt why did they show up at the hyatt because chlorine had been detected within the air at the Hyatt, like a sort of like a chlorine gas, but we'll kind of talk about what it actually was, was detected at such high levels that it was extremely dangerous for everyone in the building. Wow. And that's a big building. And it's a very big building. So it's kind of like, how did this item get there? Where was it? How did it get through this massive building? Because the Hyatt is like 20, 30 stories tall. I mean, it's... I think it goes up to 20. No, it it goes almost to 30 because the 22nd floor is the second level. It's a big hotel. Put it that way. <laughs> it's a big hotel. It's a very big hotel. The chlorine was tracked to the ninth floor of the Hyatt in the stairwell. And it was showing at a level of 1.4 parts per million, which is toxic to humans if exposed for more than an hour. So it can be very serious if you've had exposure for more than an hour. Convention goers are staying in these rooms spread through about 10 floors that were available on the Hyatt this weekend. When they reached this stairwell, specifically, so this stairwell was around the ninth floor. In the Hyatt, you kind of go into these stairwells and they look like they're creepy. I mean, the Hyatt stairwells are creepy. They're Uh like very desolate. They remind you a little warehouse-y. Like, they're those, like, uh-huh. concrete stairs that go from floor to floor. Very quiet. Very few people go through there because they're all going through the hallways, right? In the stairwell on the ninth floor, remember when I said 1.4 parts per million was toxic if you had exposure for an hour? Yep. In this stairwell, they found levels at 60 parts per million. Oh, wow. Which is almost instantly deadly. What they found in the stairwell was a canister of chlorine that had been thrown into the stairwell, and then it dissipated through the ventilation in the hotel, is where they're figuring. Now, this isn't weaponized chlorine like you would think of. So it's really not gas, exactly. It's the powdered stuff that you find at the pool store. Like that type of a concentrated chlorine. It can still dissipate into the air, but it, most people thought it was like the, you know, chemical weapon version of chlorine gas. And that's not what this was. So when they say chlorine gas, they really mean chlorine powder that was released during this time. So what would happen to you 
If you were exposed to all this chlorine, well, you could get blurred vision, skin irritation, difficulty breathing, burning sensation in your throat and eyes, nausea, and some long-term complications like fluid on the lungs, COPD, and damaged tissues. Not fun. So kind of what was happening was, you know, people are walking around the hotel and they're starting to notice, like, I don't feel so great. My eyes are really itchy. Like, what's in the air? My skin is itchy. Like, I don't feel like I'm breathing very well. What is happening? But, you know, you're never going to think, like, some weird chemical got released in the air in the hotel and we're in danger. Until people started to get dizzy. And they started to feel really sick. And then they were noticing it was multiple, multiple people that something was wrong. Well, and if this got into the ventilation system and this is early hours in the morning, like how many people were like asleep? I think that's also part of how it was able to get out was because people were asleep. So nobody spotted the canister. Nobody like was in the stairwell smelling the chlorine because they were all in bed. It's midnight on Sunday. I'm asleep. Hell, I was probably asleep like three hours ago. Let's be honest. That was part of the big danger with this is, yeah, most of the people were sleeping. They weren't aware that anything was even going on because they were asleep. Of course, because we have social media at this time, people are jumping to the social media with their conspiracy theories about what's happening. And some things that are really interesting, though, is, and I'll post the link for this, there's a Reddit that's actually real-time posts from when this was happening. So, like, you can actually read through the Reddit post and get in-person accounts of what was actually happening at this event when all these things were going on. Okay. It's it's really fascinating to look at because you've got people popping in different information and being like, well, I'm here and this what's going on and that's what's going on. Now, the big place that this was hopping was Twitter because Twitter typically is the social media that you jump to when you want to get information out quickly and efficiently. Twitter was the buzz at this time. Some of the concepts that people came up with was it was chlorine gas leaking from the pool. That doesn't make sense. And, and I think someone thought, well, maybe like the chlorine that you put in the pool was stored somewhere and it got damaged and so it leaked out. But that chlorine, it, that's highly unlikely that that's, you're going to damage that much chlorine accidentally. And then if somebody had, they would have gone and said something. That was a big one, was they thought it was coming from the air in the pool area. The air conditioner springing a leak. Well, that's not chlorine. <laughs> so no. And they and they have a huge HVAC system. Like. Right. Like, that's just not even something it, with that big of a system that that's a thing. Like, that's not a thing. A kid's science experiment exploded. It's just, there's a kid doing a random science experiment at a hotel, and they had so much chlorine in their experiment that it caused like a major health crisis at midnight were they having a kid science fair during midwest fur fest in the middle of the night i don't think so you can correct me if i'm wrong but i i don't think that they were well someone was obviously cleaning with chlorine and just used too much oh obviously, obviously. they just they apparently figured if they just like spread the powder all over the stairwell that that would just automatically clean it that was totally what was going on oh you mean that's not how that works a lot of people think, and this is possible, that this was a prank that went horribly wrong. Now, we've seen what people do to conventions. This is entirely possible. That someone was like, haha, you know what would be funny? If I released some of this and then people started getting dizzy and feeling weird? Haha, <laughs> that would be hilarious. Not realizing how extremely dangerous that could be. It's not hilarious. The problem is that's actually, like, somewhat plausible people are dumb um people are assholes and, yes they are dumb and they are assholes particularly at conventions people do really dumb things in the name of a good time but like how many times have been the like rave water and punch bowls been spiked oh i mean constantly why you can't bring bags into raves anymore i mean that's happened a lot people smash holes in walls because they think it's hysterical they break sinks off of the bathroom wall. Because they think they it's hilarious. They set up the fire alarms or the sprinkler systems or... So it is entirely plausible that this was a prank gone wrong. The other flip that people take it is this was an act of essentially terrorism. Now, you're like, 
why would someone do that at a furry convention? Why do people do a lot well, of things? Yes, but like, you may not know that furry conventions actually get like a lot of picketing. People who are against them because they think they're like evil and the devil and unnatural. There are legit people who would think that furries are such a horrible thing for society that they would try to destroy them all. This is not the only furry convention that has had an instance like this happen. And this kind of goes back to society's misconception that being a furry is only about sexual gratification. And then the other issue that they have is they think that furries believe they are the animals and then they feel that is unnatural. That's not really how the fursona works. It's a sona. It's part of you, but they don't believe necessarily that they are a fox dragon all the time in every aspect of life. It's like a part of you, not so much all of you. But some people feel that this is related then to bestiality. And so then that's against their religion. And then they feel like they need to tell all the furries about it very loudly with big signs. We've seen this at cos- for cosplay too. I mean... Well, and I think um, another thing that I've seen is because a lot of the furries are very friendly um, and a lot of kids really like the mascot style costumes, then they take it a step further and think it has to do with pedophilia when it doesn't. Exactly. My understanding, I don't have a fursona, but I know people that do. And my understanding of, like you said, it it's a part of you, but it's like, you're not delusional. Like you're not delusional where you think that you are this particular creature or character. But it's, it sounds very similar to me like when I do full LARP weekend. Yeah. And I have a specific person that I portray for the weekend with their own mannerisms and habits and dialect and just way that they see the world that I role play as. It is a part of me and I developed it and like nobody else could do it like I do. But at the same time, I go to work on Monday. Yeah. And it's fine. <laughs> it's a part of you. And when you're in that moment, in that place, you are that character. But then when you are not in that moment, in that place, you are back to your everyday self. I'm just Ash. And yep. cosplay is very similar. I mean, we, we have our at-con personas and our not-at-con personas. And, you know, when I'm Deku, I'm Deku. Especially if we're on stage. Most furries aren't any different. I can't speak for everybody, but I can say... The large majority, that's how it works for them. So I'd really like you all to know that the furry fandom is really about social inclusion and psychological well-being. It is healthy. Being a furry is a healthy form of expression and self-care. I actually found an entire Psychology Today article on this, which I will also post because I found it fascinating. But it actually goes into why this type of role play and exploration and creativity is actually really good for not only building a social network but also your self-care as an adult because we forget how to play and how to enjoy that creative explorative sides of us and doing that is actually really good for your mental health so being a furry is good for your mental health so be nice to the furries (laughs) they're just trying to have fun and make friends Well, and speaking of making friends, so of course, in true furry fandom fashion, heartwarming instances occurred when everybody was stuck outside waiting for the hotel to be safe. There were multiple videos of what was happening outside the Hyatt, and so I kind of got to watch some, and I pulled a few of my favorite moments to share with you all. There was talk about how someone went to the McDonald's, so there is a McDonald's like a mile away from the Hyatt, and got a ton of food and just started handing it out to people. The hotels around the area actually offered rooms for free to guests that were displaced who couldn't go back to their room because some floors, they just, you couldn't go back that night because it was stronger in certain places than others. Some people brought out whole crafts of hot cocoa, including like the hotel, and were just handing out hot cocoa to everybody. Because it is December in Chicago. There are furries sharing parts of each other's costumes to keep each other warm. They're having a dance party over here on one side. You've got people over here playing, like, a game on the other side. Like, 
they just took this in stride. Cuddle piles? Cuddle piles everywhere for Good. warmth. Like... And cuddles, I mean. <laughs> no one's sitting out there griping and complaining because they're stuck out in the cold. They're just taking it as it was and letting the authorities do what they needed to do. I don't know a lot of groups that could do that. Who could just take the situation in stride that wouldn't be standing out there yelling and screaming and complaining. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds like they made the best of it. They certainly did. So they still got their party on Sunday, even though they got displaced out of their hotel. So, in total, this evacuation lasted about five hours, and only 19 people had to go to the hospital. That's pretty good, out of the amount of people that are at this convention. The authorities decided pretty quickly that this was probably a deliberate act, and they have taken the assumption that someone was actually targeting the furries, and it wasn't so much like a prank gone wrong. So that's their thought process behind it is they think this was pretty deliberate because they don't think that there's any way this could have happened by accident. Obviously, someone had to plan out in advance to have the supplies to be able to pull this off, which could still be a prank, but either way, deliberate. The stairwell seems very intentional because there's less traffic and it would allow for the fumes to spread through the hallways because it's going to go up and down through the stairwell because it's open vertically through the stairwell and then it could go through the ventilation system as well by being put in that open area so even if it didn't make it through the ventilation system it could still seep like under the doors and and through the different floors by just being in that stairwell and obviously chlorine powder doesn't just get accidentally released in a stairwell that's not a thing from the pool from the pool (laughs) Magically from the pool. Like, that just doesn't happen. Like, whether it was a prank or someone was deliberately, maliciously targeting furries, it was done on purpose. So whether the person knew that if I release this much of this chlorine powder, it's going to cause an issue, or someone was dumb and had no idea what kind of issue this would cause. And they're like, haha, I'm going to be a dick. It still remains the same that it was obviously planned and deliberate and not an accident. But unfortunately... This was never solved. So they still don't know who did this. No clue. Not even a lead. There's no clues towards anybody. They got nada. Which is actually fairly impressive in an age of social media where people are stupid and tell each other that they're going to do things like this or that they did do things like this. Yeah, they didn't find any evidence. No identifying prints or any other evidence left behind, so... Which, I guess, it's in a stairwell, but the stairwell's not frequented a lot. I don't know. But yeah, as far as I could find, they've they've never found the person that did this. Well, and if it was a prank, there's a really good chance that maybe they were wearing a fursuit, in which case they would have had a mask on and gloves. Right. There's not going to be prints from them opening the door with their gloves on, I mean. Right. Well, and still, it's a stairwell, so people are multiple people are going in and out. And even if it's not a commonly used stairwell because it is towards the upper floors. It's still a common space. Like, so yeah, of course, since then there's been other attacks on furry conventions. You know, I think about this one when we go to the Hyatt all the time. It's very weird to have a true crime event happen at a place that you've been many, many, many times. And I know people that go to this convention because I'm pretty sure that Um, An acquaintance of mine was there that year, too. It's just weird. It's things you don't think about, kind of with yours, too, like random shit that can happen when you get that many people together. You know, you don't, you just don't know what can go down, which is why we have so many safety precautions in place now. Yeah. I mean, like, how many people showed up to the con on Friday, like with mine, and were like, what do you mean I can't bring my prop in? And you you just don't know what happened or what prompted it. And yeah, it sucks that it's less than it, but be understanding because there's a reason for it. Yeah, as we've said before, if the con has a rule, there's a reason they have the rule. Something has happened before. Well, and ultimately, I know it sucks, but just respect that because everyone's safety is more important than you being able to show off your prop. Absolutely. Because if they let you do it, they have to let everybody do it. You have to be firm, fair, and consistent across the board. You can disagree with a rule, but you still need to follow it. That's right. That's why we read the rules. Well, that was our first true crime episode. 
be sure to let us know if you like it because we've got some more stories in our back pocket that we would love to tell you if you're interested. We're trying to bring you a little bit more variety this season. So let us know what you like and what you don't. Or if there's anything you want us to know in general, you can always email us at podcastscs at gmail.com. Or you can DM us on social media at Lavi Cosplay or Podcast SCS. And again, I will post both of our references into the show notes when we post the audio. So you'll be able to go and look where we got our information from. If you have any additional information on either of these cases, please let us know. Because we would be more than happy to do a follow-up if somebody's got some interesting tidbits that we did not find. Oh yeah, we would love to do an update. Absolutely. Well, I think that's all we have for this episode. I'm Ash. I'm Elle. We are Lovey Cosplay. And this is True Crime That Cosplayers Say. Dun dun! Dun dun dun! You've been listening to Shit Cosplayers Say, an LVC production. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Podcast SCS. Our website is lavicosplay.com. Have a fun, crazy con or cosplay-related story? Absurd cosplay question? Or just something in general to share with us? Email us at podcastscs at gmail.com. Thank you for listening, and remember, just because you can doesn't mean you should.